Welcome to our discussion of the First World War, and this lecture will be in two parts. Now, what we now call World War I, at the time, obviously was not called World War I. People called it the Great War, because as you will see, it involved so many countries and the casualties were so high. The war in Europe started in 1914, but the United States did not become involved until 1917, near the end of the war, but played a significant part in the war, although the United States suffered far, far fewer casualties than the major European countries. Why did people call it the Great War? Well, it involved virtually all the countries in Europe, as we will see. And there were new technologies, which we'll look at a little more also, that greatly increased the number of deaths. All told, there were roughly 20 million deaths in World War I, about the same number injured. Entire empires were destroyed, such as the Austro-Hungarian Empire. New nations were created out of those destroyed empires. And as we'll see near the end of uh, this lecture, the outcome of World War II is often cited, excuse me, of World War I is often cited as one of the major causes for World War II. I'll let you read the details in your textbook, but World War I began, was based on the ethnic rivalry between the Serbs in Serbia and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. This was the initial spark that led to the outbreak of hostilities. Germany was very militaristic with the Prussian tradition, and it ended up fighting against its old enemies, the Russian Empire under the Tsar, France, and Britain. Now the spark, the incident, that led to the war was the assassination by a Serbian of the heir to the throne of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Now, why did this become the spark that led to such a global confrontation? <clears throat> well, at the time, there was a complex web of military allowance, alliances among the European nations. Some of these alliances were known, others were not, and they were secret alliances. And so when you had this relatively small incident of a Serbian killing the heir apparent to the Austro-Hungarian throne, that brought in other countries, and very soon you had two major blocks of countries fighting. You had the central powers, which are Germany, largely, and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And the other side, you had the allied powers. This is France, Britain, Russia, and later Italy. And of course, later the United States joined the allied parties. <clears throat> this is 1914, before the United States was involved. You can see in orange the Central Powers, which is also called the uh, Triple Alliance. And you see Germany there. And then to the southeast, you see the very large Austria-Hungarian Empire. And then continuing to move southeast, you see um, Turkey. And, and what well, was part of the Ottoman Empire, it's modern day Turkey. And in green, you can see the Allied Powers, um, you can see Russia. Now, at this time, Russia was an empire, and the head of Russia was a czar. And we'll talk a little more about that later. And, of course, you have France. Uh, you have Great Britain. And in 1914, you see Ireland. Ireland, at that point, was still part of the United Kingdom. Um, Later, it will become an independent country very shortly. 
Now this is the what's referred to as the first industrial war, as I mentioned a few minutes ago. It involves very many deadly new weapons and technologies. And we also now have civilians totally involved. It's not just armies off on the field battling. And entire economies are brought into war production. So much of the power of a country now, because of the protracted nature of the war, becomes its industrial might. There were 70 million men in the military on both sides. One half were killed. That's incredible. One half were killed, wounded, or imprisoned. So not all of those half were killed, but they were wounded, sometimes very, very seriously, losing arms or legs. And remember, a hundred years ago, medical care wasn't what it is today. Now, the death toll was made much worse by the the new weapons, the new technologies. And I'll show you some photos of these as we move along here. We had machine guns. For the United States, they were developed right at the end of the Civil War, really didn't have much impact in the US Civil War. Um, but now they're even faster and more deadly and all sides have them. Submarines, poison gas, flamethrowers, landmines, armored tanks, and there are others, but these are the major ones. <clears throat> this is sort of an iconic photo of a World War I soldier wearing a gas mask. And <clears throat> they, they use very deadly gases, uh, chlorine, mustard gas, and the Germans were the first to use the gas and then um, the British uh, reciprocated and the French reciprocated. This is um, a photo of obviously two soldiers with a, a donkey or, it's not a horse, I don't think it's a donkey or mule. And we have to remember at this time, in the muddy fields in France and Germany, um, often donkeys were used uh, as the main means of transportation. There were some simple railroads. Photo of a, a submarine. We'll talk more about submarines in a few minutes. This is a flamethrower in action. And as we'll see in World War II, these were used extensively on uh, in Pacific Islands uh, with caves. But just looking at it, it's uh, sensed, chills up my spine. Landmines. Here we have soldiers arming a landmine and burying it. And of course, landmines are very difficult to see. This is one that's uncovered, but they would put dirt on top of it or leaves and people would uh, step on them. Or <coughs> early tanks or their vehicles would cross it and be destroyed. They were quite powerful. This is just one example. You had sea mines also. These were the same thing as land mines, but in the ocean. This is one floating on the surface. And if a ship bumped into it, there would be a major explosion. They also had uh, mines that were under the surface. They couldn't be seen, they're three or four feet down couldn't be seen on the surface. And in addition to being activated by contact, they could be activated by the metal of a ship passing nearby. And here we have machine guns. We've all seen photographs of these. You can see these are, now the technology has developed significantly from the end of the Civil War, American Civil War. You have a high rate of fire. And this is even um, a larger machine gun. And here we have the first uh, military tanks, armored vehicles. They're armored vehicles with a cannon inside. And these, <coughs> with all the, the means of locomotion, were, um, could go through the mud 
uh, in northern France and Germany where most of the fighting took place. <coughs> Why are they called tanks? This is interesting. This was the British secret weapon at first, and so they set up factories in southern England to produce them, but obviously they needed to have a lot of steel to make the tanks, and they were very worried that there might be German spies in Britain, so they put a large tank, a large sign up at the factory and, and said it was a factory making water tanks. And obviously water tanks use large pieces of metal. And so the name stuck. People just called them tanks. Now World War I is characterized by what's called trench warfare. The trenches were dug by both, both sides along the western front. We'll see a map in a few minutes. This is essentially the area along the or near the French-German border. And there were some 500 miles of these trenches dug there. It was very difficult to move out and defeat the enemy. And so it led to a stalemate. Uh, you may not be familiar with the word stalemate. It means where neither side could move. If you play chess, that's a um, position you don't want to be in, where neither side can move. They were muddy. There were many diseases. And in fact, many, many soldiers died of diseases. Now in trench warfare, and this is something that really characterizes the fighting along the Western Front, the goal was not to just move, gain a mile, move, gain a mile, because it would be too difficult to dig a trench. Rather, they wanted to shoot from their trench, make raids, use their artillery, and inflict so much damage on the enemy, kill so many of the enemy, that they would just give up because they would be defeated. Uh, this is a photo of soldiers in a trench. This is a very rainy area. Um, in sort of northeast France, where m most virtually all the trenches are. I'll show you a map in a moment. And people had literally half a foot of water in there all the time. And they weren't just there during the day. They would sleep there. They, I'll show you the next slide here. This is a little larger section. <clears throat> and they'd have areas, like you could see in the back there, um, where you could go in to sleep, they would eat. And you can just imagine the lack of sanitation. Someone got the flu, everybody would get the flu, people would die from it, people would die from uh, dysentery, all, all sorts of uh, stomach ailments. It was uh, <clears throat> a terrible experience on both sides. And a couple miles from this trench, parallel to it, somewhat is, this is the British, trench, there would be a German trench, and between that there would be a so-called no man's land with barbed wire, and it's very flat, and so if anyone got up and tried to run across with machine guns and artillery, it would be very easy to kill them. This is a drawing of a soldier running from one trench trying to make an attack, and you can see the barbed wire there on the side. He has his gas mask on. He has a, a very basic rifle with a bayonet, and the knife in the front, which is designed in close combat to, to kill the opponent. Here we can see the Western Front, 1918. It's the blue line. On the right in orange is Germany. On the left, of course, is France. And to the north, the countries of Belgium and the Netherlands. And you can see, if you look at this for a moment, that the line, the maximum it moved was 50 or 60 miles. And that was the German offensive in the spring of 1918. And you can see the German goal, of course, was to defeat France and also to take the French capital, Paris. And you can see the Paris there. Um, about 25 miles uh, to the west of the Red Line, which was as far as the Germans got. Let's 
So we saw how hostilities broke out in 1914, sparked by a Serb assassinating the heir to the um, Austro-Hungarian throne. And then, as I mentioned, all the countries, major countries in Europe became involved. The U.S. stayed neutral initially. The president at the time was Woodrow Wilson, who had been pre uh, president of Princeton University, an academic, and he very much considered himself a pacifist. He did not want to fight a war unless absolutely necessary, for instance, the United States was in invaded. The public was split. There were many, many Americans of Irish descent or of German descent, and they supported the central powers, in other words, Germany and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And on the other side, the many, many Americans of British descent supported Britain and France, the, the so-called allied powers. Now, this was before the United States entered the war. The United States government gave many loans to Britain, so the United States, and, but didn't give loans to Germany. So the United States government was clearly hoping there would be a British outcome. But during this period of time, um, the United States, because of the strong anti-German feeling, and, and it increases, uh, leading to the U.S. entering the war, uh, Sauerkraut was renamed a Liberty, uh, Liberty Cabbage. Many, many Americans refused to drink beer because the breweries in the United States were owned by German Americans. Uh, and so there was a real split in the public. <clears throat> now, Wilson, President Wilson, although a pacifist did insist on freedom of the seas. Of course, at this time, there were no airplanes to speak of, so all transportation of both people and products um, was on the ocean, long distance, and he insisted that there be freedom of the seas. Wilson's great concern was that the German submarines, and they were known as U-boats in both World War I and World War II, and the reason they're called U-boats is the German word for submarine is Unterseebot. Some people, uh, the U-boats, they were violating the international practice. The international practice was when a ship was sunk, the combatant ship would allow the crew and passengers to get on lifeboat boats before firing additional shots to have it sink. The German submarines did not do this. They did not surface, announce that they were about to fire a submarine and uh, give people an hour or two to get off the ship onto lifeboats and then sink the ship. And the reason they, they didn't do that, <clears throat> obviously they couldn't do that. We're talking here about non-military ships is because some of the passenger ships did have uh, guns on them small cannons, and a U-boat is very small and easy target. So this, Wilson was outraged by this, as was the American public, that submarines were, were uh, sinking vessels without letting people, particularly uh, civilian vessels, escape. <clears throat> now, in 1915, a British passenger ship called the Lusitania. It was a very luxurious ship. Was, was sailing from Britain to the United States and on board were 128, a number of Americans, hundreds of Americans. The U-boat sank it without any warning and some Americans survived, but 128 died. Now, this was front page news in the United States, obviously. Teddy Roosevelt, who was no longer president, but he was still much sought after by news reporters, he called it, quote, mass murder. President Wilson expressed displeasure, but he urged patience. So 1915, 
the Lusitania sinking was a major event. However, the United States did not go to war over the Lusitania. Two years later, however, in 1917, the German government said there would be what it called unrestricted submarine warfare in the Atlantic, and no warning would be provided before sinking. So Americans thought, well, there'd be many, many more events like the Lusitania. <clears throat> this is just an ad that was in an American paper on the uh, Lusitania. This is uh, an ad to take it from New York uh, to Europe. And on the left, you can see a notice that says, travelers intending to embark on the Atlantic voyage are reminded that a state of war exists between Germany and her allies and Great Britain and her allies. And, uh, but nevertheless, there were, and this was, there were Americans on board. And you'll see at the bottom, it's hard to read it of that ad, it says the German embassy. So that's a note from <clears throat> the German embassy. Well, this is one of the, the drawings of uh, people trying to save themselves as the Lusitania went down. This is not a photograph, it's a drawing. And drawings like this were put in many, many newspapers and obviously inflamed public opinion. So, as I just mentioned, in February 1917, Germany announced that it was going to have unrestricted submarine warfare and provide no warning. That was too much for President Wilson. He broke diplomatic relations with Germany over that. Then three weeks later, a message was sent from a German official whose name was Arthur Zimmerman. So the message is refer referred to in history as the Zimmerman telegram. It was sent to the Mexican government urging the Mexican government to invade the United States of America. And Germany promised Mexico if they would invade the United States, Germany would give Mexico its territory that it had lost in the 1840s war with the United States. In other words, Tex part of you know New Mexico, Arizona, California, and also for good measure would, would throw in um, Texas. Now, this is a fascinating episode in American history. This is a copy of the actual telegram. It's the Zimmerman telegram. Now, the telegram was secret. It was written in code, and it was sent by Western Union, you know, the telegraph company. Well, it was sent by cable. They didn't have, at this time, shortwave transmission or radios. But it was encrypted, so anyone could read this. You could not understand it unless you had the key. And you can see it's directed in the upper left to the German legation. That means the German embassy in Mexico City. And it's interesting, on the upper right, it's typed in via Galveston, because this same message was, was relayed by Western Union, and one of the relay points came through Galveston, and then down to Mexico City. Well, what happened was the British received this telegram because even though Britain was at war with Germany, um, it, you know, it allowed the telegram to go out to a German embassy and it went, you know, the British got access to the <coughs> text of it and the mathematicians and code breakers in the British government managed to break the code and they sent the decoded message um, to Washington, to the US government. <coughs> so here we have a cartoon that appeared in a United States newspaper. This is after President Wilson announced this telegram. And what we have is the German government, which is the, the big arm coming out, holding a knife, carving up the United States. And what we see here 
the upper part says for myself, that's for Germany. And then it says for Mexico, Arizona, Mexico, and Texas. And then California, it says for Japan, maybe question mark. <laughs> well, needless to say, the Zimmerman telegram was shocking news in the United States. This is the New York Times headline. Germany seeks an alliance against U.S. Asked Japan and Mexico to join her. Full text of her proposal made public. Yeah, Japan, Germany rather also sent a similar request to J Japan. Well, the immediate effect of the Zimmerman telegram was the United States declared war on Mexico. The U.S. Congress declared a war on Mexico excuse me, on Mexico, on Germany. There was um, pretty much overwhelming support in the United States for the declaration of war on Germany. And it's important to understand that both in World War I and World War II, in fact, in any major crisis, the federal government throughout U.S. history normally assumes much greater power and authority that's given to it by the Congress. During World War I, um, the U.S. government took over the railroads in order to increase efficiency to move war supplies. And then in order to save food that could be sent to the soldiers in Europe, both soldiers of the United States and of uh, allied countries, they had what were called meatless Tuesdays. So you were asked not to eat meat on Tuesdays. That would save wheat, which could be shipped to Europe. They had wheatless Mondays, etc. They had various days of the week to stay, save work. And with many men off at war, the government encouraged women to work in factories. So many women for the first time left their homes to work in factories uh, making war we weapons. This is a poster from the time, Save the Wheat and Help the Fleet, Eat Less Bread. Well, you could do so by planting your own garden and you'd have raise your own vegetables. And at the bottom it says, every garden, a munition plant. And you could write there, it says on the lower right, to the National War Garden Commission in Washington, D.C. and get a booklet on how to garden, how to can your own food, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. <clears throat> now this was one of the posters to raise American morale against the Germans, destroy this mad brute, enlist. And you can see he has a club that says culture. Uh, his very German style helmet, if you look closely, it's, you can see it says militarism. He's carrying a poor half-naked woman. And if you look at the feet, of this beast that's coming in, it says America. So they're encouraging people to enlist in the army or navy uh, to defeat, quote, this mad brute. Also, people were encouraged to buy victory bonds. A victory bond is a form of savings bond. You buy it from the from the U.S. government through a, at a bank and that money then it can be used by the government for the war effort. And you do get paid back. Here's another poster, fall in, join the army or navy. Another recruitment poster, is your home worth fighting for? And you can see a nice family sitting there with a baby playing on the floor the grandfather sitting down, the husband and wife there. And all of a sudden, two German soldiers came in, come in with their bayonets. And below it, it says, it will be too late to fight when the enemy is at your door, so join today. This is my favorite since I teach U.S. history. The Navy needs you. Don't read American history. Make it. Now, this does not apply to you, my students of American history, because... I'm not asking you to go out and fight in World War I. Another one, I want you for the U.S. Army. And this is, of course, Uncle Sam. And this is also repeated. We'll see later in World War II. This is another one of my favorites. It's kind of funny. 
Gee, I wish I were a man. I'd join the Navy. And then below it says, Be a man and do it. U.S. Navy Recruiting Station. And the women did act, at this time did not actually go out on the warships, but they played a very valuable role um, acting as telegraph radio operators, all kinds of logistics um, for the uh, sailors on ships. <clears throat> this is, uh, these are women who've gone into a factory. Um, to clearly they're welding war material or perhaps material, um, other material. The car factories in the United States uh, started producing uh, military trucks and tanks and vehicles like that. And we'll see again in World War II, because so many men uh, went into the military and went overseas, that many, many more women during World War II uh, went to work in factories. Now, there, there was a great fear that there could be enemy spies. So um, this is an interesting poster that says, don't talk, the web is spun for you with invisible threads. Keep out of it. Help to destroy it. You know, spies are listening. So, <clears throat> and there were German spies, but the point is, these posters were everywhere for the time. Now, on the social side, the factories in the north needed many, many more workers uh, for war production. So this led to what's known as the Great Migration of Southern Blacks to the northern cities. So we had many blacks who were living, of course, under Jim Crow laws or racism throughout the South and uh, very poor conditions. And they moved, many of them voluntarily moved north and they did encounter racism in the north. It generally was not as solidified as in the South, but um, you can't think that the north was welcoming the blacks with uh, open arms. Also, you had roughly 100,000 Mexicans who came to the U.S. Um, they were recruited to come to the U.S. to work in military or um, factory jobs and some to work on the farms in California and Texas. And in fact, one of those programs with Mexico called the Braceros program was started in World War II to have sufficient people come into the United States to, uh, to harvest the agricultural crops. That program lasted for about 20 years after World War II until U.S. labor unions objected that uh, because the Mexican workers were willing to work for lower wages than the unionized Mexican American workers. And so Congress ended the uh, Braceros program. Now we have a diagram here of what's called this Great Migration. It had actually lasted beyond World War I to, uh, to 1930, because as we'll see in the next section, when we get to the 1920s, um, with great consumer purchases of cars, radios, et cetera, um, they, it was great demand for labor in the factories. And what you can see in this map, it, um, the Southern states are in green and then on the East Coast, we have the flow um, to the north. Most of these are blacks moving north to uh, cities, and you can see exactly where they're going is the industrial corridors. You also have from central part of the south, from Mississippi, Alabama, Tennessee, Kentucky, moving there. And you also have people from Texas, Arkansas, Louisiana, uh, moving to California. And finally, um, in the first part of the lecture, I just mentioned the es what are known as the Espionage and Sedition Acts. Um, be sure you read this in the textbook. And these were laws making it illegal with harsh penalties to even criticize U.S. participation in the Great War once the U.S. Um, entered the war. And by today's standards, these acts are considered by everybody a gross violation of civil liberties. 
but because of the great war fever in the United States, which we saw in those posters, um, the Espionage and Sedition Acts were upheld by the Supreme Court. Okay, thank you, and now please turn to part two of the lecture.